Hello and welcome to Management 201, Introduction to Professional Management. My name is Sergey Anakin and I will be teaching this course. We are doing it online. It is a synchronous, but uh, unlike the previous sections where I taught this class online, I have decided to record my video lectures so that you have them at your disposal. At least, you know, even though we don't meet face to face, there's some interaction, there's some presentation on my part, and I hope that would make things a little bit easier for you going forward. Uh, today, we start with our very first topic. Basically, what is management and what do managers do? Let me pull up my slides. And uh, we won't really talk much about management history because I think this is something that you can easily read up in a textbook, uh, but the rest of the stuff uh, I'll try to cover briefly. These lectures will not necessarily take uh, very long. I will just highlight things that I believe to be important and that I think will be beneficial for you to hear from me and not necessarily read uh, in the textbook. So uh, there are several things that I will cover today. I'll start with communication, how you get a hold of me, uh, how we communicate throughout this course. Uh, and then we move on to the course content as such. We'll talk about managers and manager responsibility, management skills, management functions, roles, levels of management, types of managers, and then depending on how we do on time, uh, I may touch briefly on some key points uh, in the history of management and some of the newer challenges that managers face right now. Uh, some items where they do not really have guidance from uh, the scholars, where there's a lot of new knowledge that needs to be created and where you guys, as you become managers, will probably have something to say and something to add to our understanding of management. So I'll start with communication. Uh, the course is primarily conducted via D2L. So all the video lectures will be there. All the assignments are there. This is how you submit your stuff to me. And this is how I communicate to you. Every now and then, I may be sending mass emails via D2L. Uh, you should have them in your regular email inboxes, uh, but I hope they would also uh, be somewhere on D2L itself so that you have everything in one place. By far, the best way to contact me is my email. You can see it here. It's also included in the syllabus. The syllabus itself is uploaded onto D2L, and I hope you guys have had a chance to uh, get familiar with it. Uh, if there are any issues there, if something makes you feel uncomfortable or insecure, please email me. I'll be more than happy to either uh, respond to your email or send a mass email to everyone to make sure that uh, we are all on the same page. Um, you may also try to reach me via my phone. With the coronavirus, I'm not very likely to be in my office, but I will receive a voicemail. So if there's something you need to tell me, you can use this one as well. Uh, my office is three to five in the Centennial Hall. But again, uh, this being a strange time in our lives, uh, I do not expect to be there necessarily on any schedule. Instead, I maintain my office hours virtually so any day between 11 uh, and 1, you can uh, get a hold of me uh, via Zoom. The only thing I ask is uh, if you contact me beforehand, saying that this is the time when you would like to meet. And uh, I guarantee my availability during that specific time block, but I'm fairly flexible. And if those times do not work for you, I'll be more than happy to schedule you for some other time. So now let's move on to managers and manager responsibility. Uh, first of all, when we talk about management, what do we really mean? And in the organizational context, business context, when we talk about management, we talk about achieving organizational objectives through efficient and effective utilization of resources. Now, what resources are we talking about? Human financial, physical, and informational. So obviously, you know, you need all of those to, to make sure that your business succeeds. 
but human is probably the key in all those cases because even organizations that have uh, largely identical financial, physical, and informational resources may have different performance and that performance will be attributed to the human qualities, to the quality of human capital that the business has. So uh, we will be spending uh, quite some time trying to figure out how to motivate employees, how to select employees, train them, retain them, promote them, how to deal with conflicts, uh, all of that stuff. That is absolutely critical. Uh, it's a critical part of a manager's job. To do the job well, a manager needs to have certain skills. Right? There are three groups of skills that we typically attribute to effective managers, technical, interpersonal, and decision-making. And all of those are important, right? If you manage in a, a manufacturing facility, you obviously have to have some, some level of technical skills because manager job implies uh, dealing with people. Having interpersonal skills is absolutely essential. And uh, every now and then uh, you will find yourself in a situation where you've got to make a decision. Right? So there may be policies, there may be procedures and rules for most typical situations. But in the life of any company, there are situations that have never been described in, in manuals or policy books. And this is where you have to exercise your own judgment and make decisions. So the ability to make decisions, the ability to make those decisions well, is also critical for your success as a manager. Uh, in terms of what managers do, right, there are four functions that we primarily associate with managers. It all starts with planning, right? This is where you set objectives and determine how they will be met. You obviously have to know where the company is going. Otherwise, it makes very little sense to try to organize the resources, right? You've got to have some objective function that you try to maximize. You have to have some long-term, medium-term, and short-term goals You've got to be able to uh, make sure they are compatible. You need to be able to reconcile potential conflicts that you find between those goals. So uh, you've got to be able to set objectives and determine how they will be met. Once that is in place, it's time for you to practice your organizing function, right? And that includes staffing as well. You need to figure out which tasks will be yours and yours alone and which you can safely delegate to others. You need to be able to identify who those tasks will be delegated to. You have to be able to coordinate the activities uh, of those individuals to whom you've delegated tasks. And you also need to allocate resources to those individuals, to different units within the organization to make sure that your objectives are achieved. You also need to be a leader, right? So leading is the third function of management. And this is all about influencing employees to work towards achieving objectives, right? You cannot really expect that just by putting people in place and just giving them certain tasks, they would really do their best to, to get you closer to your objective. You need to uh, lead them, you need to motivate them you need to give them example, you need to empower them, uh, you need to control them, if you will, uh, and controlling is the final fourth function of management. It's not necessarily exciting, right? It's not exciting to uh, be this watching eye at all times to, to you know, monitor people, to see if what they do is consistent or inconsistent with company policies, but monitoring and managing progress taking corrective actions when needed to ensure objectives are achieved is an absolutely essential function of management. So uh, one thing I, I wanna say here, we sometimes fail to distinguish between managers and leaders and management and leadership. As you can see from these four functions of management, leading is one of the functions of management. 
So management is a broader category than leadership. And this is something I want you to retain. Leadership is just one part of the manager's portfolio when it comes to important functions. I also need to say that uh, the way those functions are organized in large and small organizations are, are very distinct. So for instance, with respect to planning, large businesses typically have uh, formal plans. Um, they look far into the future. Um, they plan with a global business focus. They are rather strategic when it comes to setting their objectives. For smaller businesses, planning is, is much less formal. There are no not necessarily, you know, formal objectives at all. There are no plans, uh, there are no written strategies or, or anything like that. And when small companies create those business plans, it's typically not for them to follow. It's rather to have some external investors satisfied to make sure that, uh, you know, you can sell your vision for the company you run so that they see you as a legitimate organization. But uh, most business plans that are created, uh, they are never actually followed. So, whereas in large companies, plans are important and companies stick to them. Smaller firms, all the flexibility in the world, uh, nothing formal, uh, and things tend to change uh, quite, quite frequently. In terms of organizing, Large companies are typically, again, very formal. They have formal organization structures. There are clearly clear policies and procedures. There are three levels of management, and we'll talk about that uh, in a second. Um, it's all prescribed. It's all pre-planned. It's all there. Small companies, there's no structure at all. There's this one guy in charge of the organization and everybody is doing everything. So uh, it's very informal. People have opportunities for rapid promotion and rapid growth. Basically, they can claim whatever piece of the organization they want and, and run with it. Uh, and it works fine for some people, but not for others. Jobs tend to be more generalistic in nature, uh, it allows you to try yourself in, in different functions and, and different tasks, but at the same time, it does not allow you to develop an expertise in a specific area. So there are always trade-offs when you choose between which kind of organization to join if you're interested in growing as a manager there. With respect to leading, uh, larger organizations, because they have policies, because they have this long sitting organizational culture, managers are usually more participative. They invite opinions of other people. They uh, give opportunity to, to say what they think and you know, how they feel about the work, how they believe the work should be done. Uh, this is in some cases done to just empower employees to make them feel like valuable parts of the organization. Small firms, entrepreneurs are typically autocratic. They see the firm as really extension of themselves. They, they feel themselves in charge of the organization and uh, they, they often want to make all the decisions, right? So uh, it's not every person that would enjoy working for a smaller entrepreneurial company and obviously not every small company is entrepreneurial. But if you happen to be working at a startup led by a charismatic and strong uh, entrepreneur, uh, you're likely to see something of this nature. With respect to controlling, larger companies again have sophisticated computerized control systems. A lot of it is automated. You may not be even aware that you're being controlled uh, with smaller firms, those control systems are less sophisticated. Uh, you have to rely more on direct observation when, when controlling and monitoring your employees. So again, a very different feel for what happens inside the organization. 
even though the function themselves are the same. It's just how they manifest is, is vastly different. And uh, important management roles also differ substantially from, uh, well, between larger and smaller organizations. In larger organization, as a manager, your primary task is really allocating resources, identifying the kind of activities that need your support and those that do not. Whereas in smaller firms, managers will play more of an entrepreneurial role, spokesperson role, trying to sell this business, to peddle the business to, to outside constitu constituents. So again, a, a very different kind of a management profile that would fit larger and smaller organizations. Uh, for that reason, actually, when the company grows, when you start as a as a small entity, and if you even if you're successful initially, there comes a point where the original entrepreneur is very likely to be replaced by a professional manager. In rare cases, would the person who started the business, if it grows fast, will remain at the helm of the organization, especially if the company is supported by professional investors like venture capitalists they would actually, you know, it's almost ironic, the better you do as a manager at your startup, the faster your company grows, the more likely you will be replaced for a professional manager once your company reaches a certain level. So it's like a curse of a successful entrepreneur. In terms of management roles, we distinguish between interpersonal, informational and decisional roles. So interpersonal roles, obviously manager is a leader, a liaison, and in some uh, situations a figurehead. <coughs> figure in terms of the informational role, um, the manager collects information. So this is where monitoring comes uh, in. Manager disseminates the information and manager also a spokesperson, both within the company and to the outside world so, you know, everything that has to do with flow of information, regardless of, you know, whether it's completely internal to the firm, whether it's connections to the outside network, uh, that is also all part of the management roles that uh, they may be expected to play. Then finally, the decisional role, right? Uh, as a manager, you will be making decisions. And so there you would play a role such as entrepreneur, organizing things, uh, identifying opportunities, deciding which opportunities to go after. Uh, you'll be a disturbance handler. Wherever there are people involved, uh, there are conflicts. Right? There are things that go not along to the plan. So you have to be able to reconcile different viewpoints, to have different parties reach some sort of understanding and agreement, and uh, there's no way around it. It has to be someone with authority who can make things happen. So it naturally falls to you, the manager, to, to get the thing done. You allocate resources in your decisional capacity, right? You decide which projects to support and at what level. And finally, you negotiate. You negotiate with your own employees. You negotiate with outside entities. You negotiate with banks, you negotiate with suppliers, buyers, government agencies. So that all falls uh, to you, which is why being a manager is, is one hell of a job, right? So it's rewarding at so many levels, uh, but it also drains you emotionally, physically, and psychologically. So that's something that you need to be prepared for. Uh, levels of management. Traditionally, we have distinguished between three layers of management. Uh, first line managers, also sometimes called front line managers, mid level managers, middle managers here, or top level management. Uh, first line managers are the closest to uh, the end consumers. They're the ones that will be interacting with people who actually buy your, your product or, or services. They, would be able to provide some feedback from them to, to the top leader within the organization. And as such, they are absolutely critical. 
Mid-level managers, as the definition implies, would be right above first-line managers and below top managers. And then top management level typically starts with the positions of vice, vice president and above. That also varies from industry to industry. For instance, if you happen to be working for a banking industry, a vice president there is not quite such a powerful person. It's more of a sort of honor term, if you will. It, it indicates that the company respects you and they value your contributions. But in terms of leeway that you have as a manager, VP in banking would not really do much for you. In most other industries, VP and up, definitely the C-suite, you know, CEO, CFO, CTO, Chief Technology Officer, those people would be considered top level managers. And uh, recently it has been a newer approach to organizing levels of management where people may be put into positions of team leaders or project managers, which effectively implies that within that project that they are responsible for, they have the top management responsibility without formally being a top manager. And this is an excellent way to provide some motivation to people to also see people in action, potential top managers in action, see how they can handle difficulties uh, with, with personnel, with technologies, with customers, suppliers and whatnot. So uh, those positions are typically not permanent. They exist for the duration of the project. And uh, you can definitely then move on to lead another group or another team, another project, if you've enjoyed it yourself and if you've done a decent enough job for the company. So that is something that is fairly new in the field of management. There are still things we do not know about it but it provides additional promotion opportunities to your employees and it's not such a bad idea at all. The interesting thing, so we talk here about levels of management. Uh, if you recall those management skills that we have identified, technical, interpersonal and decision-making, even though all of them are important for managers at all levels of the organization, some are more important than others, depending on where in the management hierarchy you find yourself. So technical skills are most important for the frontline or first-line managers. For top managers, they don't really need to know much about the technological underpinnings of their organizational processes. And for that reason, as you look at really large companies and people who manage them as CEOs, it's not at all uncommon to see companies hire CEOs from outside of their own industries. And the belief is that uh, at the very top, managerial tasks are you know, things like strategizing or financial planning or whatever the case might be, are actually fairly similar across companies regardless of the industry. Whereas for the frontline managers or first-line managers, understanding the technology, understanding you know, the, the, the processes is absolutely essential because this is where products and services are manufactured, delivered, and this is where the interaction with uh, final customers occurs. So for first-line managers, the most important skills are technical, for top managers, the most important skills are decision-making skills. For mid-level managers, they're actually in trouble. They kind of need to have all three, technical, interpersonal, and decision-making skills. And uh, you know, they, they, they need all three because they still need to communicate to frontline managers, but they also potentially at some point will reach the top management level in the organization. So they have to have, those decision-making skills develop so that the top managers can assess whether or not these mid-level managers make for a good material for potential promotion. And uh, because of it, mid-level managers are typically overloaded. They are 
probably the most vulnerable position within the organization. If your company is taken over, uh, your mid-level managers would probably be the first ones to go, right? So in that case, the organizational structure will become flatter. The workload for top managers will increase. Frontline managers will probably stay where they are because they are ultimately, you know, as close as you get to the customers. Mid-level managers are overworked. They are under, under a lot of stress, possibly undercompensated. So uh, it only makes sense to get there if you see that as a stepping stone towards your ultimate career, which uh, in this hierarchy is represented by uh, top managers. All right. And then with respect to the types of managers, uh, in the most general sense, we distinguish between general managers and functional managers. General managers are really in charge of everything. So if you go to a uh, Dollar General, there will be a general manager who bears ultimate responsibility for everything. Right, so it's up to him to organize the processes, to hire people, to to you know deal with finances, to do everything. So uh, and remember what the saying is: like inch deep and mile wide. So that's that's the idea, right? You have to be a generalist. You have to have some skills in, in many different areas uh, to be able to be effective general manager to to provide guidance to everybody else. Then there are functional managers, right? These are people who have expertise and responsibility for a specific functional area within the business. So you may have someone who's in charge of marketing, someone who's in charge of operations and production, someone in charge of finance, accounting, and someone who does human resource and personnel. So in that case, you actually do need a very deep expertise in that specific domain the good thing is that nothing else is expected of you. If you're a marketing manager, no one really expects that you know the intricacies of the you know, hiring policies. If you're in operations, then maybe they don't expect you to know accounting. So you could develop expertise. You could become particularly useful to your company, but at the same time, you're kind of limited and then silo. So your opportunities for growth because of that are somewhat limited. It's very hard to break through those silo barriers and uh, move into a general manager position. And then finally, again, uh, we talked about that just a few minutes before, there are project managers. And you may think of them as general managers at a smaller scale. So typically those projects have a pre-specified duration uh, they are not as wide in scale and scope as uh, you know, the organization as a whole. So project managers are kind of similar to general managers, just at a lower level. And if you succeed there as a project manager, if you showcase your skills, if you show that you can be effective and address and whatever needs that project had, then you probably stand a good chance of being promoted up to the general management manager uh, level. Now, history of management. Again, this is something where I would suggest you probably read your textbook uh, most. I will just touch on the key points. Um, up until late 19th, early 20th century, no one really thought systematically about management. And people were organizing their activities in all traditional ways. Uh, no one was seeking any specific novel ways of improving efficiency. It was really not until the development of the assembly line and, and similar uh, organizational innovations that people started thinking about management scientifically. Right, so the idea back then was that uh, there's got to be one best way to organize operations that increases the outputs per capita within the company. So there were a lot of early studies as to how to organize operations within the company. 
how you know the semi-finished products should move through the assembly line, how the assembly has to be conducted, how much time workers have for each operation, you know, the, the specific organization of their work environment, all of that. And that had a uh, major impact on improving performance of many, many companies. Administrative theory is just an extension of the scientific management. They added a few elements, but uh, you know, altogether scientific management and administrative theory are now referred to as the classical theory of management. So the belief back then again was that you, know, you can manage employees scientifically if you do everything right, you're gonna have this best efficiency, best effectiveness. So your task is simply to find that one proper organization. And you know, as, as long as you correct there, you're gonna be fine. And then in 1930s, I think, uh, there was a very interesting experiment conducted by a group of uh, scholars uh, somewhere in Illinois known as the Hawthorne experiment. What happened there was uh, sort of the serendipitous discovery that there is a lot more to management than just this science. So initially researchers wanted to study the impact of lighting, right? How much light you provide in a manufacturing facility on the outcomes. And so when the got to that plant, you know, whatever the plant was doing, they decided that they needed to light it up a bit more. And so they did, and the productivity went up. Well, they thought that makes total sense. Workers work better if the environment is lighter. So at the second step, they increased lighting somewhat more, and the productivity went up. They increased it more, productivity went up. And then for whatever reason, they decided to decrease the light intensity in the facility. And you know what happened? The productivity still went up. And they started trying to figure out what exactly was going on. And their explanation was very surprising to even to themselves. So workers improved their productivity not because lighting was good for them, but because they felt that management cared about the working conditions. So whenever any change was introduced, they believed that the management did it to make the environment better for them. And this is why they, they, they sort of worked more intensely in trying to make the managers happy in return. So it is then that we acknowledge the importance of psychological factors, you know, the sort of the softer side of management. And that has been in the management toolkit ever since. And then with the development of the information technologies and computers, uh, we got the development of management science, right? So do not confuse it with scientific management. This is management science. So here we'll look at things like operations research, operations management, you know, kind of logistics kind of studies, management information systems. So a lot of uh, economic benefits were reaped from uh, developing management science and applying it to management, uh, to managing companies uh, until we started looking at integrated perspective. This is where we started for the first time to integrate systems theory, socio-technical theory. So we started bringing all of those different approaches together and it all made sense until like so many other things in life, someone made an observation that, you know, like those same kind of managerial uh, devices work with different efficiency or effectiveness in different circumstances which gave rise to the contingency approach, which basically says it all depends. And probably the last 50 years or so, uh, scholars were trying to figure out what those factors are that determine relative effect of different approaches to organizing the activities on the final outcomes, right? So uh, 
I don't know if this is particularly instructive to just say that it all depends, but this is where we are, just trying to find those factors that explain the relative effectiveness of one factor or another factor in uh, influencing whichever organizational outcome we are interested in. Uh, there are some videos on the history of management that I would ask you to watch. We are not going to do that as a part of this presentation, just to save time. The links are embedded into my PowerPoint slides, which are available in detail. So I definitely encourage you to spend a few minutes and uh, take a good look uh, at that. And uh, finally, some of the newer challenges in management that render a lot of our thinking about the effects and, and management strategies sort of obsolete. And there's this rapid technological development. All of a sudden, it's not uncommon to have virtual teams that connect remotely from anywhere in the world, and we don't really know how to manage those teams. So there's been some research into how to do it best, but uh, you know, it hasn't been around long enough for us to really draw any conclusions. So technological development and, and changing the tools that we use and changing the way that our work is organized. You know, even now with COVID, with a lot of people working remotely, we don't really know what to expect. We don't know how to organize it. People are not ready, companies are not ready. In a way, you guys are advantageously positioned because you're still young. You know, if you accept this remote way of organizing work as something that is normal, you'll stand a much better chance to succeed in, in future industries. So, but again, we cannot really provide you much guidance just yet. Globalization is a major challenge. Right, so now companies can attract the best qualified workers from anywhere in the world, which brings with it a lot of benefits, but also a lot of challenges. So it's not just employees that you bring from elsewhere, your markets are elsewhere as well. So you need to be able to navigate this really complex system of global trade. You need to know when to, to adapt your products and services to the local markets and want to keep them the same. Um, there are so many moving parts here that managers often get overwhelmed. And even though they may have all the skills, technically speaking, uh, trying to, to implement all that knowledge and you know, trying to utilize all of that under such a strong environmental stress is a very challenging proposition. So this is something that you guys need to be aware of and uh, you know, pay attention to global processes. One day uh, you probably would be working with suppliers or customers that operate from someplace else. You probably will be working with uh, foreign co-workers and uh, this is something you need to prepare yourself for. Virtual teams, we kind of touched on that and gig economy, right? So the, the very way that economic activity is organized sort of does away with the traditional organizational processes. Previously, a lot of employees had, I think of it as employment for life. You join a company when you're 20, you, you grow through different levels, you know, initially as, as an entry-level employee, then maybe as, as a supervisor of some sort, you know, foreman, then you go into management and grow through ranks there. Many Japanese companies still practice that same approach, but they would move you across different functions strategically over 20 years until they find that this is where your skills are best applied. Right now with the gig economy, people are fine workers, subcontractors, right? They are fine not having this one employer for life, they actually appreciate the freedom that this flexibility gives them. You know, if you think about uh, the success of uh, Uber and Lyft, 
it's partly explained by how attractive this gig economy model is to drivers and it definitely benefits us, the users. But as management scholars, we do not understand those processes well enough just yet to give you guidance guys on how to do that. So in a way we are in the same boat. We're trying to learn, we're trying to see how things work. And if at some point you have some insights and you wanna share, I definitely would be most uh, appreciative of, uh, of your advice and insights. And with that, I finished my first lecture. So I hope I did not bore you to death. Uh, feel free to email me uh, with whatever questions or feedback you may have for me. I will take that into consideration. Um, thanks, and I'll see you next week.